G'day, mm. welcome back to the Weedy Garden. Mm. A year's gone by since I started my garden here on the hill, far away from any town and even further from the city. I've learned a lot in 12 months. And I'm really beginning to understand how the soil is like the stomach for each and every plant that grows on this earth. I've seen some plants thrive and I've also seen some die. But with each step, with each wheelbarrow full of soil that I create here in my garden, I get closer and closer to that somewhat secret life of plants. I'm continuing the grounding experiments. I'm building a worm farm in an old bathtub. And I'm cultivating seedlings of fruit trees which will become a food forest. The big news of course is that I'm studying permaculture. I'm learning how to observe patterns, looking deeper into cycles of life and nature so I can nurture this little weedy patch that I call paradise and share that knowledge with you. It's easy because it's online and it's mostly videos so I can sit back and watch, listen and learn as long as I have my computer turned on. Really, it's about reversing the damage. In this next series of three videos, I'm going to share my swale journey, which started with my own words. What's a swale? When I was first introduced to permaculture, back in December last year, when I met Jeff Lawton. To give you all the info from the start, Jeff has allowed me to share this first video. It's taken from the online permaculture design certificate course, which I'm doing at the moment. Next week, I'll post the second video I made while Jeff was here in the, in the weedy garden, showing me hands on how to dig a swale for this garden and do it right. On the third and final video in the swale series, I'll show you how I built a swale for my food forest weedy garden style. I'm really honoured to be able to share the journey with you. By the end of this little video series on swales, you, you'll be able to harvest and utilise water wherever you live in the world. Welcome to the swale series. And now, I'll hand you over to Jeff. Okay, let's have a look at swales. Swales are long level excavations that come in many forms and widths. They can be just small ridges in gardens, or rock piles across a slope, or excavated hollows in flatlands and low slope landscapes. They're not elements that fit into steep landscapes. Like soil conditioning, swales loosen soils and absorb water, storing it in the soils and the sediments. They intercept sheet flow and let it infiltrate, recharging the groundwater. Overland flow is interrupted for a few hours or a few days, and then infiltration becomes regularly downwards water moving at right angle to condor down towards the groundwaters as a recharge into the soils and assisted by the tree roots. Trees are essential as components of swale systems. So most of the time are swales on slope. They're a mound excavated out from the trench to the mound. And our topsoil is increased at the mound and it's loose. And most of the time we're planting trees up on the mound here and just below. In deserts, we may plant inside because we've got less rainfall and it's hard to drown the trees in the desert. So you may move inside but the infiltration of water is at right angle to contour and it plumes away as it sits here and then soaks in. We also plant the backslope, often leguminous trees on the backslope here, fixing nitrogen. And the 
roots here help the absorption. So the roots grow quickly, chasing the water as it goes down, slowly soaking in. Swales without trees risk waterlogging and local rainfall deficit because of the lack of evapotranspiration and the potential of too much water storage. Because they're on contour, interrupting the sheep flow, they stop all the water moving past, just temporarily, and then just soak it in. That water disappears into the soil. The trees take some of that back and transpire it to the atmosphere. Tree planting must accompany swales in all areas. So swales are like, say, are tree growing systems. And it's of most, utmost important in deserts where there's so much rain that's needed. So there's a chance that as you interrupt the flows of rain that come so infrequently and often in large events, you can stop it, soak it, grow trees that transpire more water to the cloud base. There's a chance it's going to increase the rainfall. It will definitely in increase the condensation in deserts. The potential crown spread of the fringing trees. So as the trees grow, the crown spread from one side to the other, shading the swale. This is what we need to understand. The width of the swale can be governed by the crown spread that will shade our swale, further reducing water loss to evaporation and dissolving salt concentration and water loss because this water won't evaporate, it'll soak. Now, the back slopes and the inside trenches of swells can be grazed. It's possible to run animals in here and put temporary fences up and graze animals on the back slope up to the inside of the mound. Eventually, it won't make any difference, but grassing this well won't have the same effect as the trees. Grazing between the back slope and the hangover forage from the swell trees can be quite beneficial because the manuring here in the swale, when it rains, dilutes right the way along the swale. You get an even dilution of manure all the way along, and that's soaking in. But you can't expect grasses and herbaceous growth to have anywhere near the same evapotranspiration to the cloud base. You've got to have the trees with their deep tap roots to increase that absorption. Swales can be wild, widely used across the climates. Dryland areas, they can be very large because you've got to stop as much rain as you can when it comes in those large events and soak it in and get through most of the year. Reassuring your landscape of trees, tree growth giving you shade, tree growth stopping evaporation from wind. They also, of course, work in humid tropics and humid cool to cold climates. And the hydration of the swell builds over about seven years. Each year, year one, year two, year three, year four, it gets up to about year seven and you've got the maximum rehydration plume where each time it rains it comes a bit more and then you get to a maximum. And it will fully hydrate to the maximum size and then quickly drop off the bottom They'll be recharged, the maximum recharge to the ground water. So you have a dampened hydrology that wets up as quickly as possible. Water available from wet season to dry season. It's, it doesn't matter that it rains in winter and your growing season is in summer because it extends over one season. And the roots reach their maximum influence at about seven years. So the roots of the trees are coming down and they're increasing the infiltration effect. Essentially, swales are always perfectly dead level with no water flow. So water sits passively, rises like a tide, 
and then soaks in. They're not compacted and they're not sealed. They're made to soak. They're uncompacted. Swell width and swell depth can vary in relation to the size of a property. Small properties, small swells, of course. Large properties can be quite large. Slope can make a difference. The speed of infiltration on local soil types. Shallower, wider swells in sands and narrower, deeper swells often in clay fraction soils. And after one or two good soaking rains, you can seed and plant your swell to trees. On both banks, because you've got a certain amount of soak on both sides, capillary action will take the water out to the back slope and on down. And it will take a few years to overshade the swell base and accumulate humus from leaf drop. There will be a certain amount of leaves coming in and accumulation of humus, but there will be, after a few years, a lot of leaf drop from the actual trees. And as efficiency increases, extra water can be led in. So you can lead in diversion drains from country, picking up water from hard services, overland flow, extra water enabling planting of high value trees. So you can bring in different trees as the swell starts to function better and better. You can increase the quality of trees. And the, and the swell itself can handle more and more water over time. So that enables you to move the system up, advance it in quality. And that's what they're all about, advancing the quality of the system. Swells can be a great benefit with hard service runoff in towns, particularly subhumid and arid towns, to reduce the costs of the efficiency of stormwater runoff. Soak in the water into tree growth. Tree growth that could produce fuel, mulch, food products, even fireproof towns. All roof water and roof water tank overflows, grey water waste could be led to swells. And it doesn't really matter if swells or in sand or in clay, in sand or even cinder ash. They grow trees, initially pioneer trees, that slow and absorb and hold water for longer. And once established, high value trees can then be planted. And swells at the opposite end of the scale in heavy clays work well. Initially grown pioneer trees with roots that penetrate the clay breaking it up and increasing the absorption. So it's not the material that you're swelling through, it's the pioneer trees that you might have to go to in sand as you're planting initially, or in clay. The different types of pioneer trees that actually favor the different extremes of material. And then as the conditions change, as you improve the absorption, as you improve the fertility, then you move into high quality trees. We know that this works. The trees grow faster and are healthier on runoff fed swells than trees planted in open country. In arid areas, it's most important we plant trees on swales or salt concentration may occur downhill and collapse soils. So we know the trees are pumping the water cycle and stopping the concentrations of salts. Swells are just temporary events, really, over the long period of time. They're replaced by trees. Trees take over the function. They are the precursors to the rehabilitation of forests in a region. And they give us that convenient contour lineage to work with. The base of a swale, when we look at the base of a swale, it can be ripped to increase absorption. It could be graveled, so we can gravel the base of a swale. Or it could be sanded. 
And on small swells, they can even be mulched. So you can deep mulch a swell in a small swell in the garden. You won't have enough material for a large swell. Or you can put down gypsum to loosen clay if you're in heavy clay soils to allow more in water infiltration. The spoil of the swale is normally mounded downhill. So our topsoil's there, the excavation has come over to our mound. But in flat country, there might not be a mound because in flat country, we'll spread the material out on the lower side usually, but it won't look like there's a mound at all. So you'll get a flat profile of a swale. And the distance between swells changes to country. On hill country, the potential vertical height of the trees at maturity projected horizontally to the hill as a maximum density. That's an average sort of approach. So as a hill comes down and it changes in steepness, where we have our swells, the height of the trees projected back. The potential height of the trees comes back each time. And that's the maximum amount of swells we need. So as we go into the steeper country, that projected height makes the swells closer together. As we get on the steep, it's closer. As we get on the shallow, it's further apart. But when we look down from the bottom of the hill, when we look up, all we can see is canopy. It looks like the whole landscape is forested, but there's lots of interswell there because these are actual lines of trees. There's a group of trees in that line. But that's just a rough gauge. There's no exact about this. It can change to country. Another way to gauge distance is 3 to 20 times the average swell width, depending on rainfall. Most useful average size swell bases are around 1 to 2 metres, and the inter swell space, 3 to 18 metres, but there's no absolute average. It's more likely that the closer space in, in rainfall that's quite large, say 120 centimetres, 50 inches, and wider spacing in rainfall of light, small rains of 10 inches, 25 centimetres or less. In humid areas, the interswell is usually fully planted with hardy species, and many of them as mulch-producing species. In dry areas, maybe it's quite bare, and mainly functioning as runoff for the swells themselves. But mulch will blow into swells and wash into swells. As, as water flows, it'll bring organic matter in. Organic matter will arrive in swells and fine dusts and silts build up in the swell bases. They become deposition systems. They're collecting all kinds of detritus material. That in itself is increasing fertility. They naturally actually build soils. And over a period of time, they will start to fill up and become level terraces over a very long period. But by then, you've got a very large forest there. You don't need to swell. Or you can cast, side cast the material out onto the mound and increase the mound. You can actually keep redressing it. doesn't matter. You can even put domestic waste and organic matter into a swell in buried pits. You can bury pits in a swell. This is like swell furniture, swell attachments. These will fill up with water and they will become rich soil deposits inside a swell, either in the mound or in the trench itself. And on windy sites, the swale spoil bank, this swale bank, it's actually a very sheltered starting place for plants and trees. 
and every six to ten swell can be planned into a windbreak where wind is the limiting factor you can use the swells themselves as windbreak swells and the swells in between as production swells so they go into another function and we know ridges should always have windbreaks because ridges are out there in the wind but also there's more condensation on ridges and that condensation is a trickle down moisture with nutrient and if it's swelling downhill we're picking that up and spreading it out swell sections can be over deepened as well so there are places where we can put in deep sections and this is most effective in clay fraction soils, creating kind of ephemeral ponds. Where if we're in sands, we can often go into widening for more effect. And in volcanic fraction soils, which are like sands as well, very absorbent, there we can create soak pans that readily absorb water and increase the groundwater recharge. Swells can be kept to a convenient width so they can be a foot track or they could be a wheelbarrow track in a garden or they could be on a small property a quad bike track or they could be a tractor track on a large property they can be used for transporting supplies in and produce out there are many different functions for a swell you need to get a longer swell to get material in, to mulch, to compost, to fertilize, to water possibly in really dry periods. You might want to flood as well if you've got dams uphill. And you need to get product out. They're a convenient way to get across country because they're perfectly level. We are continuously surprised at the performance and function achieved by swales. Thanks for today, and thanks for watching. I'm going to go and have a bath now.